They know how to go up, cut someone, kick someone to pieces, cut them with a glass. That is what they know. The Cray twins were far too violent, far more violent than was necessary, and they were clearly getting off on the violence. I was told quite clearly there was a price on my head. There was a, a bigger price on other people's heads, but uh, it worried me enough. When they tried to model themselves on the Mafia, they saw themselves as, as Mafia-type gang leaders. They commanded a hell of a lot of respect. The name was very, very well known and very, very feared. I can assure you of that. Very feared. <laughs> On March the 5th, 1969, identical twins Reginald and Ronald Cray were sentenced to life imprisonment. They were 35 years old. I'm not going to waste words on you. In my view, society has earned a rest from your activities, and I recommend that you be held for at least 30 years. Since their early 20s, the Crays had been building a criminal empire in the East End of London. An empire of fraud, gambling, protection, and ultimately murder. Their arrest heralded the end of an era. Demolition and development is now replacing the worn of clubs and pubs that formed a backdrop to their activities. Yet the East End of London is as much attitude and tradition as it is architecture. And during their years of freedom, the twins etched a lasting chapter in the stories that are told there. A compelling fascination that is destined to outlive the twins and all who knew them. Inevitably, the craze will always be remembered as Britain's only gangsters. Born in 1933 to Charlie and Violet Cray, the twins had grown up on the streets around their home in Valence Road. Weaned on boxing stories from their grandfather, Cannonball Lee, a renowned fighter in his day, they soon found a channel for their energies and aggressions. Boxing had long been associated with the East End, where it was seen as one of the few ways of escaping that environment. Their older brother, Charlie, had been a champion in the forces and was eager to help the twins on their way. Well, I came out of the Navy and um, I started to teach them to box and in my mother's house I arranged a small gym and punch bag, etc. And I trained them at home for one year and then um, after the year was over I thought, well, now it's time to take them to a, a, a boxing club, which I did. And from that day on, uh, they kept winning and winning and winning they never stopped. Identical twins, both successful boxers soon became a talking point in the East End. But their notoriety was beginning to spread outside the ring. In 1949, now 16 years old, Ronnie and Reggie were arrested and charged with grievous bodily harm after an incident outside a dance hall in Hackney. It was their first visit to the Old Bailey. They were acquitted through lack of evidence. Already, people were unwilling to testify against them as the legitimate side of their life became clouded by a growing reputation on the streets. As the Cray's reputation for violence spread, they started to attract people to them. A gang was beginning to form. The rumour was floating about the East End that it's these two young tearaways out of Valence Road was, you know, going into pumps, picking on people, putting on little teams, because the East End and the West End was dotted about with all little teams. Each little area, like the Watney Street mob, you had the Commercial Street mob, you had the Limehouse mob, the Poplar mob, all little mobs, all very handy people. Gambling was still illegal, but the East End was riddled with spielers, tiny one-room clubs outside the law and ripe for protection. Through the mid-50s, the Cray's empire grew to encompass fraud and extortion. Their gang was now known as the firm. One night it was packed out, a brick come through the window. Of course, he said, I know it's trouble once a brick comes through your window. Uh, you know, it's problems, of course, they're all scattered, wallop, wallop, wallop. And a guy who was in the club at the time said, Bill, you want to go down and see the twins? Sort this out with you. You're going to have problems. I said, oh, I will. 
Ronnie come right out of it, he said, it'd be a pony a week. Which them days was a lot of money. Twenty-five pounds a lot of money. Well, Charlie was a joking bloke, very nice fella. In my opinion, never was a villain and never would have been a villain. Reggie, you look at him in his eyes, you smell fear. And fear came on for Ronnie, you know? Oozed out of him. He had a, a smile, all oh, let's take it two ways. Either he's smiling at you because you're going to get hurt, or he's smiling at you because he likes you. I mean, Ronnie would be laughing and joking about it. All of a sudden, he'd pick on you. Ronnie was becoming as aggressive as he had been in the ring, even with members of the firm. I was up the club speaking to George and Alan Dixon, and Ronnie happened to walk in. And I never seen him. Hello, Bill. And he stopped dead, went in his pocket, pulled out a Beretta, went up to Dixon, and Dixon was about six foot three. Ronnie was about as tall as me, I suppose, what, about 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, Put the gun to his head and bang, bang, pulled the trigger twice and nothing happened. I thought it was a joke. Ronnie took the two bullets out and he said, here's your birthday present, George. It was apparent that Ronnie was becoming unstable. For some time, he had been open about his homosexuality confident that no one dare question it, but his use of violence was becoming irrational. In 1956, he was convicted of grievous bodily harm. The twins had been separated. That's when he received his three years, and that was the origination of the real, real bad, bad problems. And that's the origination when Ronnie, I uh, feel, went strange. Ronnie was certified insane and transferred to Long Grove Mental Hospital. During the three years he was away, Reggie and Charlie opened the Double R Club, a legitimate venture into London's lucrative clubland. In 1960, the twins, now reunited, became shareholders in Esmeralda's Barn, a thriving club in London's West End. They were to acquire an interest in several more. Craze were immersed in a lifestyle totally at odds to their underworld activities. Everything seemed to have been arranged. Wherever you went with them, the doors were opened. Uh, people were waiting for them. And they were treated like celebrities already those days. It was a new phase in the Craze career. Now they were mixing with celebrities and nobility and courting influence there. But beneath the glamour, little had changed. I was paying protection money at the time. I assumed that a lot of other little clubs and drinking clubs which were smothered all over the East and West End, I should imagine they were getting their few quids all over there and a bit of fiddling here and there. Uh, nothing very big, but it was heading that way. The crazed network of clubs, fraud and protection was now a substantial concern. Yet headquarters was still at the family home in Valence Road. From here, Ronnie now organized military-style operations to protect and expand their empire. I've been in there in the morning, come about 10 o'clock in the morning, still in bed. You walk in the kitchen and on the table be knuckle dusters, flick knives and a beretta. So there was plenty of ammo there, plenty of gear there. And it was uh, given the name of Fort Valance and Ronnie was called the Colonel and that's how it all started in the early days. The days of the razor and the knuckle dust are all gone and a straight fight and a good boot or a bottle. And uh, I know people disappeared. There was quite a lot of shooting going on. A lot of crimes were ascribed to them. People always said, oh, that's down to the, the Cray twins. Ronnie and Reggie did that. Whenever something happened, it was always Ronnie and Reggie. And yet nobody was doing anything about it from the police investigation point of view to find out whether these were facts or whether they were just rumours. 